Well, good morning, Coalition. It's good to see everybody this morning. And we have a very special edition of our uh, Friday Facts this week. We have Steve Hahn, Communications Director for AERP North Carolina joining us. But first, let's um, have a couple of announcements. Sure. So good morning, everyone. Uh, just a reminder that our April meeting will be combined with the Coalition on Aging. That's going to occur on April 22nd. We will be sending out more details and an updated calendar invite shortly. Also a reminder that coming up this month, April 16th, is National Healthcare Decisions Day. Shane has a draft of that flyer, and once it's finalized, we'll post it to the website and send it out via email. Uh, there's also a handful of other um, events and announcements coming up. It's on the website, so I'd encourage you to check that out. And that's it for me. Happy Friday. Yeah, super. Thank you, Virginia. Appreciate it. So we have Steve Hahn who is again, the communications director for AERP North Carolina. And uh, good to have you with us, Steve. Oh, thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. So Steve, we wanna know about who Steve really is. We've seen your, your happy face. You're the co-lead on our um, communications advocacy and education working group here, but um, I bet there's a lot of things that people don't know about Steve Hahn. So tell us where you're from, what you did when you were growing up, uh, the aspirations you had, and, and I'll ask a few other questions along the way. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, before I begin, I just uh, want to wish everybody a happy April Fool's Day. And uh, I already played one on my daughter this morning. I told her the store manager school, and there's no school today. And uh, she almost cried when I told her that, that it was an April Fool's joke. So I know the payback's going to be big tonight. So if you have any good ones, uh, that won't get me uh, in any trouble. Put them in the chat. Uh, anyway, so uh, thank you, uh, Dave, uh, David. I kind of will follow the form that uh, most of you did, and I'll kind of go back. Uh, I'm a Midwesterner. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Minneapolis in my early childhood. But I claim Akron, Ohio as my true hometown because that was kind of what I call the formidable years of junior high and high school uh, when those memories are real strong. Um, I'm a, uh, I know Shane's a Midwesterner too. Uh, I was gonna tell you some Midwestern jokes, but they're way too corny. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, maybe my favorite Ohio joke is uh, the town of Mechanicsburg. Uh, why did they change, want to change the name of Mechanicsburg to engagement? Because it's halfway between Marion and Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about the best that I could do there. But uh, I was, uh, grew up in kind of a typical middle class, uh, middle class uh, upbringing. Um, I know when I say Akron, Ohio today, everybody says LeBron James, LeBron James, but uh, my high school actually has a number of, of, of famous graduates. Uh, so if you're a music lover, uh, I like to brag about uh, graduates from Akron Firestone High School include Chrissy Hind of the Pretenders, uh, one of the members of the Black Keys, two of the members of the band Bevo, uh, the uh, astronaut Judith Resnick, who unfortunately was part of the Challenger uh, that exploded. Um, so number of uh, kind of famous people all out of my little high school in Akron, Ohio. Um, oh. So I was a pretty typical kid. I loved sports, um, in particular basketball. Uh, but when I stopped growing in about the eighth grade, I knew that I had to get more serious about school and uh, find some other interest quickly. And so uh, uh, after graduation um, from high school, uh, I went to uh, Bloomington, Indiana to attend Indiana University. And so I don't know uh, if people are movie buffs and they saw uh, the movie Breaking Away in 1979, uh, but that movie had some type of impact on me and I wanted to visit the campus. And when I saw it, I fell in love with it more so than any of the Ohio schools. So 
I made my way down to Bloomington, Indiana and studied uh, telecommunications there as my major. And so at the time I was still aspiring to be funny, to be a comedy writer. Most of my school projects uh, for telecommunications uh, were original comedy, comedy skits. And so I, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, after graduating, um, I actually went and tried my hand at some stand-up, and I was way too nervous. And I followed some acts that were way too polished and better than, than me. Uh, luckily, I didn't tell many people I was doing that, but my best friend and his dad at the time saw it and probably teased me about it for the next 30 years or so. <laughs> so uh, I found kind of a, a more serious track. Uh, my first job, real job in television, uh, was producing a program for the American Federation of Teachers in Washington, D.C. So I was uh, hired to uh, be a production assistant and really the promotions person for a program called Focus on Education. And this was a half hour public affairs TV program that was hosted by Edwin Newman, if you remember Edwin Newman from NBC News. Yeah. And so we uh, talked about issues in education reform at the time. AARP had a very dynamic uh, leader, Albert Shanker, if anybody's familiar with uh, education and education reform um, of that era. So that program aired on 130, uh, uh, 130 channels. There was a, uh, a network called the Learning Channel uh, back at that time. So it ran on the Learning Channel and it ran on uh, really a number of PBS affiliates. So that was kind of my introduction um, uh, not only to uh, working in TV, uh, but it was my introduction to education issues, but most importantly to the labor movement. Um, so once again, um, you know, in my upbringing, I didn't really know that much about uh, unionism, about uh, you know, the history, about its value in society. And so you know, through at least my early career, the first 10 years or so, um, I spent largely focused um, uh, uh, on labor issues. So uh, that program itself, we were able to produce the whole series in about four to five months. Uh, so it left me with the question is, what do I do next? And so I uh, ended up going to work for a PR firm that was connected to the AFT. Uh, but they, there too, I had an opportunity to kind of broaden some of the issues that, that I was working on. So not only did it um, include uh, the AFT per se, but we worked with the Sub Southern Governors Association, a couple of its leaders at the time, Governor, uh, uh, Governor of Delaware, Mike Castle. Uh, and we worked, uh, which I thought was fascinating in my early days with the National Organization of Women during um, mm -hmm. a real serious attempt to overturn Roe versus Wade. And so that was really a great experience early on. Um, to, to introduce me to top tier media who were following that um, and, and leaders uh, of, the women's, uh, of the women's movement too, which led to some kind of a, additional work down the line. Was that um, in the Gloria Steinem era? Well, no, this was, uh, this was af after, uh, I don't know if you know, Patricia Ireland, uh, names mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Oh, you're Patricia Ireland. Those were the kind of leaders of the movement back then. Gotcha. Um, I was so green. You know, they would, I got very lucky. They would call on me for some strategic decisions. It was mostly guesswork at the time, but it all turned out very well. And so, so I look at it as kind of a combination of right place, right time, and, and a lot of good luck uh, working with them. So uh, after that, uh, um, after that, uh, uh, while I was at that firm, we did just a whole, still a whole lot of work for the AFT, and I think they were probably scratching their heads, uh, thinking, why are we paying agency fees to a person we had for a whole lot less? So they uh, ended up um, hiring me back to do an organizing campaign for them in Indiana. So for you political junkies out there, the young Evan Bayh, uh, when he was first elected governor of Indiana, had promised the state uh, employees who never were able to form unions collective bargaining rights. And so uh, every major union went into the state with the hopes of organizing about 36,000 state employees. And so the AFT, I had an affiliate that represented um, state, state employees. 
And so we went in and kind of courted them and formed a coalition with the UAW and ended up um, kind of winning, winning uh, a good number uh, uh, of, uh, of new members in the state that uh, they still represent today. So that was, uh, that was in the early 90s back in Indiana. Um, so after that organizing campaign, I was kind of eager to uh, come back to DC. I, I kind of liked it, still you know, had my friends in Washington. And so um, I went to work for another uh, union uh, and the, the union is, was called the International Union of Electronic Workers. Hmm. And uh, they now merged into a larger union so they no longer exist. Um, but at the time, the, the strong debate at the time was NAFTA. So I don't know if you remember Ross Perot and that giant sucking sound that he talked a lot about. <laughs> and the, the fear out there that so many US jobs would disappear and be lost to Mexico and China and elsewhere. And so the president of, of the union was a very, very vocal opponent of this. And he was a little known guy in the labor movement. He didn't, didn't really have any leadership positions within the larger body of the AFL-CIO, but we're able to create a lot of visibility for him. And so the other unions took notice. And so a, me and a friend of mine at the time, um, also from the IUE, uh, formed a PR firm called Tricom, Associ Tricom and Associates. And there too, we um, really um, targeted some of the other labor uh, work that was out there. So we uh, probably the highlight of that time was we have we were working with the American Federation of Government Government Employees, uh, John Sturdivant, during the first government shutdown. Um, so those that remember Newt Gingrich and company, um, it was something that was uh, very shocking to most Americans, you know, for the federal government to be shut down. So uh, we just really had a number number of events to get their message out um, at the time, which to me it was incredible because it was almost like being in a presidential campaign where uh, you know we'd have a room and there would be probably 40, 50 TV cameras um, in the room because so much public attention was focused on uh, what's going to happen and when this is this going to end. So I thought that was great, great. Um, largely, you know, we worked with a number of the other uh, unions. We had work from the from the Teamsters, from the AFT, uh, from the IBAW, um, a lot of good stuff. So Tricom still exists today. Um, I was in its early days. I was, you know, working seven days a week for probably very little pay at the time. And I said, well, there's got to be an easier, <laughs> easier way. Uh, I didn't have a lot of uh, confidence that I could continue at that kind of that pace. So, so you were working in, in DC at the time you were living yeah, there. So yeah, so this firm's uh, still based out of Arlington, Virginia. So uh, from there, I, I kind of joined forces with another, a little more established firm at the time. They're a polling firm um, called Fingerhub Powers and Smith. Uh, they too had a lot of labor representation. Uh, so their clients uh, had, too had some overlap with Tri Tricom but they didn't have any media relations capabilities there. So they, they did polling, they did some writing, uh, print production and other things. So I went to uh, this firm and I kind of started a media relations function for them that they're able to offer as an additional client service. Uh, probably the highlight there um, was uh, my work with the utility workers union. Um, that was the time when deregulation was first being discussed. And uh, the, that union was really the strongest voice in sounding the alarm on what could be the ill effects of deregulation. And when I look back um, at some of the stuff that we produced, it was like a crystal ball. Um, when we look what happened in Texas, uh, when we look at Enron, when we looked at some other things, it was just amazing the foresight um, that they presented, but they were successful at least stopping mandatory deregulation in a number of states. And so that uh, to me, when I look back was kind of the highlight of my experience there. And so uh, while I was at Finger Up Powers and Smith, a good friend of mine at the AERP uh, that I had known uh, from way back uh, to my first days at the AFT said, I've got, there's a job here. I think you'll really like it. 
Uh, so I went, uh, I left, I left uh, that firm to uh, do a stint with the national office at the AAR, uh, AARP. And it was just a terrific experience for me. Um, that's really, truly where my health education began. Um, even though we did some work um, with unions that represented healthcare workers, my responsibilities at AARP at the time were I led the communications efforts around their health advocacy. So I had so many great minds there to, to, to learn from uh, to, to help give me a base of knowledge um, around um, some very important issues that we're still still dealing with today. Um, there too, probably the, the highlight on most of the time that I spent over there in the background was the Part D benefit that was added to Medicare. So that was a long, long, hard fight. Um, you know, AARP was very big in public polling. Uh, we knew that uh, people didn't want to, to monkey with the program because they felt that there was a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. And so until um, they made some strides to at least rein in um, some of this, uh, the general public was reluctant to add any more pieces uh, to a program that they thought was ripe with fraud. You know, there's always stories in the paper about uh, various providers ripping off the system. And so that really stuck with the public and we had to make great strides to push back on that. And so Steve, so, let, let me ask you, so what time frame are we talking about here? Well, let's see, yeah, let me look at my notes. So that was uh, those, that was like in the uh, late 90s. So like 98 to, I think that was past maybe 2005 or so. Okay. So it was, yeah, it was kind of a, I know that we, that we, that's the, the, like I said earlier today, the wheels are slow. So, you know, seven years, maybe not so slow for, for major federal legislation, mm -hmm. um, but it was a hard fight. And, um, and unfortunately it turned out to be partisan in the end. So this is, um, this was a tricky issue because of the partisan politics around it. Uh, leading up to this, it was traditionally the Democrats who favored expanding programs. They expand, uh, you know, they Democrats took more of a general interest in in making improvements to healthcare. But at the time when the Part D benefit was passed, uh, uh, George Bush was in the White House. Right. So obviously they get all the, they got the credit for it. They're the ones who got to sign the bill. They're the ones who got to hold the press conference. So it became a lightning rod. So our friends, our democratic friends all started accusing ARP of all kinds of nonsense. They said that, you know, ARP standing to make billions of dollars off of this. And it just, to me, it was an unfortunate ending to something that was worth great celebration over. And yeah. so, uh, you know, that, that at least benefit remains in place. It remains strong. It's important, but you know, to, to work so hard on that and then to kind of have your friends accuse you of all kinds of nonsense at the end was, that was kind of a, that was kind of a tough ending to that, to that fight. Uh, but it was a lot of great things. I mentioned the fraud piece. We had partnered uh, with the federal government to have a whole campaign called who pays you pay. And this was to make reporting of any suspicious activities around uh, Medicare a lot easier. Uh, for the most part, I don't know if you still get the mailed statements, but people would get their mailed statements and throw them out. They, you know, Medicare is paying for this. What do I need to worry about it? So we encourage people to review those. If there's anything suspicious in there, uh, we gave them some easy reporting mechanisms. And it ended up really working well. So they, you know, I, I don't have the, I don't remember the final number at the time, but it saved millions and millions of dollars through some of this reporting that that campaign produced. So, um, Steve, let me yeah. interrupt you. So at some point along here, you got married and you started having kids. So tell us just a yeah. little bit about your, your beautiful wife and, and what she does. <clears throat> yeah, no, I'd love to, because uh, I got married uh, kind of later in life. I was, uh, I was uh, 
bachelor until my early 40s, and I, I've been married now almost 12 years. My wife is uh, she is a musician and a program administrator. Uh, her 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 real job is she's the music program director of the National Gallery of Arts, so she's still back and forth to Washington. Uh, but here in North Carolina, you can catch her every now and then. Uh, she's invited to perform. Uh, she's a classical pianist, so there's you know some demand for that. So. This weekend, she's uh, doing another program with the North Carolina uh, Symphony. Uh, for anyone who's in Charlotte who likes classical music, I think there's another performance coming up at the end of the month. Uh, but if anyone's interested in any of that, happy to, happy to share those opportunities and, and any comp tickets that are passed along uh, <laughs> through that. <laughs> uh, but uh, so let's, let's go kind of more directly to the healthcare piece of this. Um, yeah. So I left AARP, I was looking for broader management experience. I had a small team there and I went to CMS. And at, while at CMS, I ran the press office. Uh, so I uh, managed a larger group. So I went from three to 15. Um, mm -hmm. What I didn't realize it's when I took that job is that every healthcare company in America is trying to pick off those employees on a daily basis. Um, thinking that they're going to get some type of greater access or inside scoop on some of the reimbursement pieces um, that they're responsible for. So I'd get daily calls, you know, I'd get calls from headhunters, friends, all these things. And so I had a friend who called uh, another AARP contact. She was up at AstraZeneca. She said, you're going to love this. And from a federal employee salary to an AstraZeneca salary, I, my eyes were wide open. And so I went up and I joined, joined AstraZeneca for about four and a half years where I was in corporate communications, largely responsible for their feel good pieces. So, you know, we all know the scrutiny on the industry, uh, but they also did a lot of good things, especially in their hometown state of Delaware. Uh, so I was responsible for their patient assistance program. Uh, I was, uh, did a lot of, um, a lot of stuff around quality measures and you know how this all fits in. Uh, so it was really a, a great experience in addition to um, having an opportunity to uh, work with global colleagues and to, to do, do things that, that were a real terrific experience. But as David mentioned, um, uh, you know my wife, I got married while I was there. She was in Washington, so I wanted to come back. Um, and I got a job with the uh, with ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and uh, there too I was uh, I led their policy communications. Uh, probably the proudest achievement there, which is still up today. If you go onto their website, uh, you see an interactive timeline of progress made against cancer. Um, it's called CancerProgress.net. The whole idea there was. Um, there's a reluctancy among Congress and, and, and others at the time uh, to, to, to provide additional uh, research funding uh, for cancer, thinking that very little progress has been made. So we wanted to push back hard on that to show them that great progress has been made. And so that's kind of the genesis of this timeline was to demonstrate that, you know, that you know, we're think, not thinking about this right, that there's been just tremendous progress and we need to keep it up. And uh, so, so I uh, just spent a short, short time, short time there and, and I had my first child. And, uh, you know, I was in pretty good shape. I had, like I said, that long bachelorhood, so I didn't have the, the, the tremendous expenses that younger families have. And so I was in the position to kind of do what I wanted to do at the time. And I wanted to um, do something that, that I enjoyed. I really loved my uh, days with AARP. Um, while I was at the national office, I got to visit so many state offices and just really loved that small team. I love to be close to the members, uh, to see quicker progress being made uh, through, through local and state government action. Um, I just really enjoyed that work. So I wanted, I said, well, this is, this would be a great experience uh, to come into a state office. And so I've been here in North Carolina now, uh, unbelievably for 10 years. And, 
So I've had just a great experience here. Um, I've gotten to work with all of you. Uh, the issues that, that we have are, are, are so important to, to so many people. And so I feel, you know, every day I kind of wake up with a mission in mind and I feel, you know, uh, my work is meaningful still. So kind of that's where we stand, you know, in a, in a snapshot. I hope uh, I didn't bore everybody uh, uh, too much today with that. And uh, just kind of turn that over if we have a few more minutes to David or any of you who have any other questions. Well, we, we have one from Charlotte here, Charlotte Sweeney. Uh, what vision is in your view for the greatest achievement AARP can achieve through the Serious Illness Coalition, what what, what uh, connection do you see? I see it's it's the support for family caregivers. Uh, you know, so many of us are in that situation. Um, so many of us are in the situation. We have, I forget, 1.7 million family caregivers uh, in the state. Uh, many are, you know, strained. I just, you know, my dad became seriously ill and it was quick. So I was, I was fortunate. But I know people for years and years who have to juggle work and family and other things and uh, often paycheck to paycheck to take care of their loved ones. So I think any progress that we can make uh, to support family caregivers uh, through uh, community support uh, programs, uh, through uh, information resource and the advocacy that we do is going to help so many people. Uh, that's great. That's great. And certainly a lot of folks uh, on the call right now are engaged in caregiving and in uh, and, and supporting of that. So that's wonderful, Steve. And we appreciate your, your strong uh, encouragement in that regard. So you've won an award or two along the way. Just I know you, you don't like to brag, but uh, tell us just a little bit about one, of the, one or two of those things that uh, you're most proud of. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, a few things. Uh, AARP, probably when I was at the national office, I kind of won their communications uh, MVP award, uh, mainly through, you know, sweating bullets through all that, through all the Part <laughs> uh, stuff for being the guy that had to deflect all the negativity at the end, uh, you know, for, you know, just immense coordination um, there. There's, uh, mm you know, between the national office, all the field offices and all the uh, uh, departments at AARP. At AARP. Um, I, I, I like to joke that, you know, at the time I would uh, have to sneak out of my office at about 7.30 at night. Oftentimes I just leave my suit jacket on the back of my chair so people would still think that I was there. But it was uh, really just an intense, an intense time, uh, an intense time. So. Uh, I, I like the, the work balance that I've been able to achieve in, in North Carolina. And uh, I've liked the extra opportunities that I've been provided through working with, with you all. I also serve as board chair, a uh, temporary board chair <laughs> for Friends of Residents. Uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with that group, I also do a very important work in, in nursing home advocacy and, and long-term care. Yeah, and it's much appreciated, Steve. I know Lauren Zingraft and Bill Lamb and company uh, all appreciate that. And uh, we're, we're working to, to build more uh, collegiality between all of these different organizations, and you're doing a superb job of helping facilitate that, so thank you. Well, Steve, this has been great. Um, Mark says, uh, we at AARP are so fortunate to have Steve on our team. And that's absolutely true. Um, he makes us all look good. Yeah. yeah, we feel the same way about Mark and everybody involved. Uh, I, I know everybody has a little, at least a little bit of connection to AARP. So uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough. Well, we absolutely uh, do. And, and Steve, this has been great to uncover the, uh, the, the history a little bit. And uh, we know there's a lot more in there, but uh, that's been a great uh, summary of, of uh, many years. 
uh, aspiring to, uh, I suspect, SNL at one point. Uh, you yeah, I know. Them. Focus on education was a far cry from SNL, but... Uh... <laughs> There's still time, Steve. Yeah. You know, you've got a third, you've got a third chapter that comes up, and we've that, got a lot right. of people that are living their best life now, so don't give up yet. That's yeah. right. I need to learn how to be funny again. <laughs> Charlotte says, more jokes anytime. <laughs> Be kind to that little girl tonight when you thank, when she comes yeah, home thank you. Yeah, yeah. Be careful out there. I know some of these April Fool jokes will absolutely they get you. Thanks so much. Everybody, you all have a great Friday and uh, weekend. Don't uh, don't take April Fools too uh, too seriously. Thanks, Steve. Bye now. Thanks. You all take care. <laughs>